Okay, so we were talking about uh, Matthew's use of the Old Testament, and it's a bit problematic. It presents a challenge to us because, like elsewhere in the New Testament, but especially here in Matthew, it seems he's taking passages that, that don't appear to be saying anything about the Messiah and saying, well, uh, this passage, Jesus fulfills this scripture that this, uh, this happened, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken through the prophet. And when we look back at those passages, they don't seem to have any relevance or don't seem to be speaking of the Messiah. And so we said, if I can find it there, we need to understand not only are there direct fulfillments where there's a obvious and un, you know, incontestable prophecy of the uh, uncontested prophecy of the coming of the Messiah, but there is another use of the Old Testament, we said, where there's uh, types and antitypes and analogies are made, comparison, and that's what we see Matthew doing. Well, we went through that at length Sunday morning. I'm just adding one more verse to what we talked about. I want to add here Matthew 2.23, because this text, Matthew refers to the Old Testament scriptures being fulfilled in Jesus growing up in Nazareth when he's taken to Nazareth where he, he grows up. Of course, he was, he was born in Bethlehem, and then we know that Joseph was warned by God in a dream and fled with Mary and Jesus as a child and as a, a toddler to Egypt until Herod was dead, and then when he came back, he uh, noticed that he goes to Nazareth. And um, verse 23 says, I actually wanted to do this. Let me see if I can do this. I forgot. I wanted to uh, slide this out of there. for. Whoops. I wanted to slide this out of there for a minute. Not that it's going to matter now. Um, can I slide that out of there? Okay. So notice verse 23. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth. And... So what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled. Well, the problem with that passage, does anyone know what the problem is with that passage? So that what was... There is no prophecy. There is no... We can't really find that statement anywhere in the Old Testament that the Messiah would be called a Nazarene. But if we understand uh, Matthew's typological use of the Old Testament, he cites a number of times, starting in chapter 4, he starts applying the uh, references that Isaiah makes to the coming Messiah. He starts applying Isaiah's prophecies to Jesus. And so we see a connection that he's making with what Isaiah foretold in the coming of the Messiah, and so it's thought that uh, he is linking this likely, even though it's uh, a, a number of suggestions that, that have been made, I think it's the case that he's linking this to the branch of Isaiah 11.1, 1, that there would, there would come a root out of uh, a branch, out of the root of Jesse, that there was a promise that... Uh, there was going to be from David's descendancy a, a king who would reign, and Isaiah talks about that coming Messiah in that context. And in a context that Matthew ultimately applies to Jesus, and the reason we, we think maybe that could be a, a vague allusion to Isaiah's branch prophecy is that uh, the spelling of the word Nazarene, he would be called a Nazarene, is very close to the spelling of the, of the Hebrew word for, for branch. Now that might not seem like much to us, but that was not uncommon for the Jewish rabbis. That, and, and let me get that prophecy right. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, that's the ESV, and a branch from his root shall bear fruit. And then it's apparent in the overall context of Isaiah, this is a messianic prophecy. So um, that similarity in spelling, this was not unusual in rabbinic teaching 
to find these kinds of associations where there's a similar word or there's a similar sounding word and then to make uh, or even take a term and find one term in one uh, prophecy or one statement of scripture and then another term in another and link them together. And so that, that would not have been considered an illegitimate use of the Old Testament just even to draw on the spelling of Nazarene matching the branch of Isaiah's prophecy. So that, that would be sufficient to explain what Matthew might be alluding to there. there there's a broader picture as well that could be uh, uh, brought to bear on that. But just another example you need to be aware of, of how Matthew uses the Old Testament. And as I said, that'll help us understand how um, other New Testament writers use uh, typological fulfillment of the Old Testament as well. But let me just add this. Consider these also before we leave that point behind. Look at Joseph, how Joseph is warned of God in a dream, right? So Joseph takes Mary and the child down to Egypt, and, and the Lord speaks to Joseph in a dream before this, right, to tell him about the birth of Mary. So Joseph is receiving dreams. And is there, isn't there another Joseph who is a dreamer who uh, talks about dreams that he had in the Old Testament? So uh, no doubt Matthew's Jewish readers would see that kind of similarity and find that to be uh, of, of interest. What about, and, and by the way, Joseph became in the Old context, Joseph the dreamer became the one who was the means by which God saved Israel in the time of famine. And in a similar way, Joseph receives dreams, the of Mary, and he uh, saves Israel, he saves Christ, the, what we'll see, uh, whom we'll see, Matthew presents as the new Israel. What about, we've already mentioned this, Jesus being tempted of the devil in the wilderness 40 days. Well, we, we've already pointed out the similarity to Israel being in the wilderness 40 years. And during that time, God said he was testing them, whether they would walk in his law or not. And they failed and they murmured and they complained and they rebelled again and again and again. But Jesus goes out like Israel into the wilderness and he faces testing and he proves to be true to, to God. So he proves to be the Israel the son of God that Israel failed to be. And then, uh, you know, the Lord Jesus going up onto the mountain to deliver what we think of in the Sermon on the Mountain sometimes as the, as the charter of the kingdom. Well, he does that by going up into the mountain as Moses went up into the mountain to deliver the law. So there are a lot of these, what we call these echoes. We, we see Old Testament imagery that, is surrounding Jesus, and so occasionally Matthew will pull something out specifically like an analogical situation or something in the life of Israel that is similar to or a sort of shadow or type of something that's happening in the life of Christ. So that helps us understand the way, part of the way that Matthew is using the Old Testament. Any last thought, question, or comment on that? And if you weren't here, that class is uploaded. We ended up spending much of the class on Matthew's use of Isaiah 7:14 and the virgin the prophecy of the virgin birth of, of Christ. So I encourage you to go back to that, and we can reference people to that in the future if they want to look a little bit further. Joseph told his brothers about his dreams. And his brothers called him the dreamer. Yeah, here... Behold, the dreamer cometh. <laughs> right, two, uh, imagery, two, two, yeah. Right, right. 
somebody's focus, some other prophet's focus, without it actually being written down in the Old Testament? Um, yeah, is it possible that it's a prophecy that we don't have in the canon of Scripture, an extra canonical reference that we don't have? Um, that I think that is offered as one, one possible solution. And in fact, you, you bring up the accepting the inspiration of the Bible. We do need to know how to answer the charges the skeptic might make of that, for example, that Matthew... See, there are some religious scholars who will, who will do that. They'll say... Uh, well, Matthew, this, this is a, not an inspired document, that he wasn't being guided uh, by God in what he wrote, and it's evident that he was just doing whatever he wanted to. Like, there was no ethical requirement for Matthew to be honest with the Old Testament. He'd just take it and take a word and distort a meaning. And all. So we need to be able to answer that. And so that's, there's an apologetic basis for this, to strengthen our faith in the credibility of the Bible, because that is under attack. And our young people often go, out to co often go off to colleges, even Christian colleges, and have their faith in the Bible undermined, because they've never heard these things addressed. Did you ever hear any of this addressed? When I was in the school of preaching, we didn't, I don't remember this being <laughs> addressed. Back when I went to school, the school certainly would, has grown and would address that kind of thing now with students because we need to be able to help those we're ministering to in the Word in our preaching and teaching ministry to be able to defend the Bible. However, now uh, that's in defense of the Bible from the viewpoint uh, of the skeptic coming at the Bible. If we accept though, as we do based on the, the evidence we have available to us that the Bible is the Word of God, that it is Scripture, and that the writers were being guided by the Holy Spirit in what they wrote, then we can simply accept by faith that there is some prophecy, whether we can identify it or not, that Matthew was referring to. And that was the point I was trying to make, too, uh, Sunday when we talked about Isaiah 7.14 and we talked about uh, the use of Hosea 11.1, uh, out of Egypt I called my son. Well, that might seem to the skeptic as though, well, there's no real prediction being made in those verses that you can say that proves that Jesus is the Messiah. It's just him looking back on a text and finding some, some similarity and then saying, well, this is a prophecy about Jesus. Well, uh, from the, that's why we went through what we did to be able to answer that criticism. But if we accept, uh, as we do, that the Bible is the inspired Word of God and that this Matthew is being is making these references under the superintendence and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, then we know that God had that in mind, that this is a legitimate use, that when Hosea said, out of Egypt I called my son, even though he was looking back to the Exodus, that Matthew can legitimately say that looked forward to Jesus because if, if God says that's what he had in mind in that verse, then, that, then he did have that in mind in the verse, even if that wasn't evident to the human author of the Scripture. So your, your view on inspiration or your view, the, the presuppositions you take to the text will determine how you look at those prophecies, right? So that was something I, I didn't uh, specifically address the other day, but, but I hope it was implied. I hope we understand that. Why do you suppose the Holy Spirit did certain things with Matthew that he didn't do with Mark or Luke or John? Well, I said that if we understand how this is done by Matthew in the text, then we'll understand how the New Testament in general uses the Old Testament, because this is done. It is done elsewhere in the New Testament, especially in, in, in the book of Hebrews. Paul does it, I mentioned, in making an allegory out of Sarah and uh, Hagar, right? When you read that, it doesn't doesn't appear to be anything allegorical at all about it. And Paul draws this big... Uh, um, takes this uh, uh, story in the Old Testament and he draws this big lesson about the distinction between the covenants. So it is done elsewhere in the Old Testament. But Matthew's use there, Matthew 2 of Hosea's prophet, a prophecy, is the locus classic, classicus. It's the, it's the text that is often the starting point for discussing that issue because it does seem to have absolutely no prophetic to the coming of, of the Messiah. So um, why would the Holy Spirit have Matthew use 
the Old Testament in a certain way? Well, because this is the Jewish gospel. So it's going to make the most, you're going to have, a, the, I think, the most typological usage of the Old Testament because a Jewish audience, Jewish believers, would understand and accept that, that kind of hermeneutical approach to the scriptures. So that makes sense to me that you, you find that especially in Matthew being the, uh, being the, you know, the Jewish gospel. Whereas, you know, when you see in Isaiah, Isaiah 53, that application to Jesus where he, he's borne our griefs, he's carried our sorrows about um, his rejection and his suffering and all the gospel writers take that and apply those to to uh, Jesus. Now, now, in modern Judaism, they don't accept Isaiah 53 as a prophecy of, of uh, Jesus, and I don't think of the Messiah, or else they treat it as the fulfillment of it was in Israel, the nation of Israel itself, and not in a particular individual. So they have ways that they uh, dismiss the application of Isaiah 53 to Jesus. But I think we can see in that context of Isaiah, he's clearly foretelling the coming of the Messiah, and he is clearly foretelling his suffering and his rejection. And so when you see the New Testament using that, it's, uh, it should not be contested uh, whether that's a legitimate use of the Old Testament application to Christ the Messiah. It's these other kind of texts where you see that issue arise. So, um, well, in studying the Gospel of Matthew, you get into some more of the other suggestions about Matthew 2 and that prophecy about the Nazarene. Just wanted you to be aware of that. Now, as I said Sunday, we talk about Matthew and the law. I preached a lesson on this Sunday night, and I need to reincorporate a few of those uh, scriptures here again to get it in the, in the class. But this, isn't exact, this is not exactly the same as talking about how he used the Old Testament. Here we're talking about specifically the idea of God's law and of the law, the law of Moses. But the way Jesus talks about the law of Moses, we see principles about our understanding of God's law in general, even for us under the new covenant and the relationship of the Christian to the law of God and even, even to the Old Testament law. So this is, a, this is distinct from what we just looked at. You'll see that's evident uh, as, as we proceed. But remember we said when we were looking at the context, the historical context of this gospel, this was a major issue in the early church. What, what is the nature of the law? What are the greatest commandments in the law? Is, uh, in, the, in the church there was uh, a concern about whether Gentiles had to keep the law, whether Jews were bound to continue to keep the law, but mainly it was an issue where Jews were still practicing the law after they became Christians, and w then were uh, binding it on Gentiles as well to say they had to be circumcised and they had to bring themselves under those kinds of, of requirements from the law of Moses. So this became an issue. Is the law still binding? Can the law justify? This is why Paul addresses these kinds of things in his early epistles. Because early on, when there was mixing of Jew and Gentile, these were big concerns. Just like we've got our issues, like divorce and remarriage, and, and the whole uh, uh, form of worship, and bringing unauthorized innovations into worship, all of that, and uh, trying to make uh, worship entertainment oriented, and, and these kinds of things that are problems for us in our culture, well, they, they had these issues that you see the um, epistles addressing in, in the church. But you can see this in Matthew's gospel. You can see it in Matthew's gospel as well. Is, is the law still binding? Uh, if so, in what way, what parts? There's a continuity that we see with the Old Testament, but there's a discontinuity. There's a fulfillment of it and there is a, um, even though Jesus said, I came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. But then in Paul's letters, Paul says uh, he abolished the law and the commandments contained in ordinances. And he took them out of the way. He nailed them to the cross in, in Ephesians 2 and in Colossians 2. And some people think what Paul says in his letters 
about the law is at odds with what Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew. Well, let's see why that, that might be. And remember, we have to understand this is a time of transition in the early church. So when the gospel was preached and Jews became Christians, they didn't just stop being Jewish and stop practicing the law that had been a part of their family history for generations and for centuries and for millennia, right? Um, and so that whole question though, about the law and Jesus' attitude toward the law, we need to realize, and we won't go into this in depth, but we need to understand how central the idea of Torah, of the law, was to the Jewish community. It's at the heart of their very identity, uh, the, who they are, what makes us who we are, what makes us the people of God, is, the, is that we are descendants of Abraham, number one, and so our fleshly lineage is a guarantee of our uh, acceptance by God and the Torah that we have and we keep the Torah. So we're part of the covenant that God has made with Abraham where we inherit the blessings of the covenant as the people of Abraham and the, and the Torah. Well, these come together in Christ. Jesus brings these together in fulfilling the law and bringing and, and, and being the fulfillment of what was promised in the covenant and bringing a new covenant. It's a beautiful way to see how Jesus brings those together. So let's look at a few points now. Let's run through some of these uh, from what we can see in Matthew's gospel about Jesus and the law and these ethical principles that we can draw from him. And we know, especially from the Sermon on the Mountain, we get some of these texts. But uh, the reason this is something we're noting here in Matthew is because Jesus says more about the law in Matthew than he does in the other Gospels. And some think that this was because uh, Matthew was trying to, trying to sort of mediate or maintain a middle ground between extremes where you have, uh, you have on the one hand the, the temptation, let me go here, you have uh, the temptation toward uh, antinomianism. That's just from the, the Greek word nomos for law, so to be anti-nomos against the law. The idea that, well, now that Christ has come, and this is a problem today, right? Now that Christ has come, we are saved by grace, and there, so we don't have to worry about obedience to, to law and to commandments, right? Because now it's all about relationship. Which, how many times do we encounter that when you try to get people uh, to question their beliefs and their practices, and you point out what the Bible teaches, and they don't think they really have to be concerned about exactly what the Bible says, because after all, it's just all grace, and um, we, we, it, it's not about even, even countering people who believe they're saved by the blood of Christ and that they belong to God, who are living uh, sinful lives, but they, they still think they're saved because they just think it's only about grace and not about being obedient and living a transformed life and all that. So we still have problems with antinomianism and we still have problems with legalism on the other extreme where we tend to bind our own traditions or bind things that go beyond the Word of God or to have an improper emphasis where we start to sort of leave the impression or begin to think that our confidence with God and our security with God is based on our law keeping. See, that's something that Paul deals with in his letters. But you can see that in um, Matthew's gospel. So that, that, I don't think that's the whole of what Matthew is doing and what he tells us about Jesus' statements about the law. But you, you might see that, for example, in, uh, on, on the side where it might appear uh, to counter antinomianism in chapter 7, 21, uh, in chapter 7 verse 21, uh, Jesus said, only those who do the will of the Father will be in heaven, right? Those who do the will of God, chapter 20 and verse 15, those are my mothers and my brothers. Or chapter 25 in the judgment scene that Jesus, where he depicts everyone being brought before him, all the nations and separated like a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And who, who, who ends up saved and who ends up lost? Those who are saved are the, the ones who showed compassion, those who ministered to others, those who were doing the things that God 
calls on you to do. And then the ones who are lost in that parable, in that depiction of the judgment, they're, they're not lost for doing anything, but for what they didn't do, right? So there, on the one hand, that would be an answer to that. But on the other side, if there was a legalistic tendency to want to think, okay, yes, the Messiah is here, but we still have to keep the law, or especially the law of Moses, in order to be saved. Well, Jesus came to save his people from their sins. In Matthew 26, 28, it's in Matthew's gospel when he's at the table with the disciples. It's in Matthew that he says, this is my, the blood of the covenant that shed for the remission of sins. That's in Matthew's text. That's not in Mark's account of the, what Jesus does at the table with the disciples. It's not in Luke. It's not in John. But there it's in Matthew that he connects the new covenant and the sacrifice of Christ with receiving forgiveness of sins. And so we learned that we need Christ's blood to forgive our sins. Law keeping can't justify us. And if we think uh, uh, keeping the ritual of the law will justify us, remember they have the golden rule. Well, the law and the prophets all hang on uh, doing to others as you would do unto yourself. That would tend to answer some of the uh, legalistic uh, attitudes in the early church and how the great commandment is to love God with all of your heart and love your neighbor as yourself yourself instead of thinking that the w what matters most to God is that I have a checklist of these ritualistic things that I make sure I do ritualistic cleansings and uh, not not doing any work on the Sabbath and uh, uh, et cetera et cetera those kinds of things so you could see uh, an answer to that perhaps in Matthew's gospel to that sort of thing so on the one hand, there's a tension in Matthew's gospel because there are times where it appears Jesus is stressing obedience to the law and that the law remains authoritative. That uh, in chapter 5, he says, uh, you, you have to keep even the small commandments of the law. And anyone who breaks those commandments or teaches other people to break the commandments, he's going to be called least in, in the kingdom of God. So here Jesus is showing great respect, or the, he's emphasizing, let's say, he's showing respect for the law and emphasizing the necessity of being obedient to the law. Uh, on the other hand, we'll find at times where Jesus abrogates or sets aside something in the law of Moses, as he does in chapter 5, 31 and 32, and in chapter 19 with the... Uh, what the law taught about divorce. Under the law of Moses, there were circumstances where a man was allowed to divorce and put away his wife, just if he found some unseemly thing in her. And she was free to remarry. And Jesus comes along when he's questioned about that and says, especially you see in chapter 19, he says, well, Moses allowed you to do that, but I say unto you. So he actually uh, takes authority or says that he has authority to... Uh, abrogate or to set aside what Moses said and call us back to God's original intention at the creation is what Jesus ends up doing and saying you have to be faithful in marriage and God doesn't allow divorce and he only gives one exception. So, so we have to work out that tension. We have to look at uh, carefully as we go through his gospel. Well, how do we navigate that where we see at times Jesus setting aside what Moses said and other times he seems to be reinforcing the need uh, to keep what, what Moses said, reinforcing uh, obedience to the law. Well, I think we can understand, first of all, if we realize Jesus is claiming, this is a radical claim, but he claims, it's obvious, that he has authority to interpret the law, to bind things upon men, to, to in a sense, supersede the law. I might want to uh, sort of put that in quotes, maybe, to think about a, a better word. But you see that in chapter 5, 21 through 48, in what are called the Matthean antitheses, where he said, you've heard that it was said, but I say unto you. You've heard that it was said, but I say unto you. Um, he, is, he is looking at what the law says, and he's not doing what the rabbis of the day would commonly do. They, they might look at it and say, and then appeal to uh, the midrash, the, the, the body of interpretation, uh, of rabbinical interpretation of the law in the, 
uh, Talmud. And, and so they might say, well, Rabbi so-and-so says this about that verse. Or Rabbi so says this means that about that verse. And Jesus comes along and said, well, you've heard it said, but I'm telling, I'm saying unto you, this is what it means. I'm telling you, this is what God meant when he said that. And he's not appealing to any rabbi. That's why at the end of the Sermon on the Mountain, what do they say in chapter 7? In Matthew's account, when they're done in chapter 7, 28, they're astonished. When they got done, they walked away wide-eyed and slack-jawed like in the text says because he taught them as one that had authority and not as one of their scribes so Jesus is claiming authority to tell you what the law really means and if necessary or in certain circumstances to say and I'm I'm binding something that Moses didn't as he did with, uh, say, in the case of, of divorce. So we'll look at that more under Christology when Jesus makes a claim. When they come, li th listen about this. Let me just give you a little teaser for, for this. Because when they come to him and challenge him about the Sabbath day in, uh, in chapter 12, and he tells them, you need to go learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Imagine Jesus telling these Jewish leaders who tell him he's breaking the law, you need to go back and read your Bible. <laughs> That's what, basically what he tells them. And, uh, but, uh, and he says, and you know, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. You're questioning me about the Sabbath? I made the Sabbath. You think I don't know what the Sabbath is for and what's right or wrong on the Sabbath? I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. That's a claim to be God. That is a powerful claim that sometimes we overlook as a, a, an evidence of Jesus' uh, self-identification uh, uh, as deity. All right, well, yeah. Yeah. Well, and that would, that, that would fall under this antinomian side where you feel like, okay, well, uh, um, Jesus might have said this or God might have said this and maybe this is what it means, but that really doesn't matter in the end because I know God's grace is going to save me because Jesus loved me and died for me on the cross, you know, so that uh, what he actually said, me actually having to do what he said doesn't really matter. Well, Jesus said only those who do the will of the Father will be in heaven. So there's some sense in, w in which what I do is relevant to whether I go to heaven or not. So, yeah, that would, yeah, we're, we encounter, I, I really think Matthew speaks to the problems we have in the, in the Christian world, in the church today because of uh, tendencies to fall out in one direction or another about the law. So let, let, let's look a little further. Jesus, Jesus claims to fulfill the law, that word fulfill, play raw. We talked about that. It's a key word in Matthew's gospel, that idea of him filling up the meaning of it. And uh, remember, these statements are unique to Matthew. When he's baptized in chapter 3, now all four Gospels talk about Jesus' baptism. Only in Matthew does he say this was to fulfill something. Well, what was it to fulfill? This is to fulfill. My submitting to this is a fulfillment of something. It's to fulfill. It's a concept that's rich in Matthew's gospel. This is to fulfill all righteousness. Then, then in, the, in the Sermon on the Mountain, he says, uh, don't think that I came to abolish the law. I came not to abolish it, but to fulfill it. All right, there's the passage. I'm sorry, I have this slide that I moved to. Notice he says, uh, when he was baptized by John, this is to fulfill all righteousness. So that word play rao is a very important word in Matthew's gospel. And so is dikaiosune, uh, um, the word righteousness. We'll see that's a part of the theology of Matthew's gospel. I have a whole separate category for that, what Matthew says in his gospel about righteousness. He uses that word over and over and over in his gospel, and it's hardly in the other gospels at all. So this is clearly something distinctive about Matthew's gospel. This is where he said, don't, don't think that I came to abolish. I didn't come to abolish, but 
fill it full. I've, I'm, the, I'm the meaning. I'm the one who fills up the, the Old Testament law with meaning. We'll look at ways in which he may do that. And in fact, he says, notice that I say unto you, and this is something you hear often discussed, that uh, until heaven and earth pass away. So he doesn't just say, until I die on the cross and the new covenant and the new era is officially inaugurated. Actually, it's, being, it's, it's already breaking through into the, into the earthly realm and underway in Christ's ministry. But even if we wanted to, to, to look at a, a dividing mark, it's say at the cross or at the resurrection or in Acts chapter 2 when the gospel is proclaimed for the first time in the name of the resurrected Lord. He doesn't say at any of those points. But he says, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot. What's, what do you have in the older translations? What, what's the language? you? A jot or a tittle. That's kind of a fun word. It's a weird word to say, right? Tittle. Uh, we don't talk about tittles. A uh, jot and a uh, tittle. You have to be careful how you say it. So that, look, here are, here's the Hebrew alphabet. And here's a text from, uh, this is a text from Genesis chapter 1. Okay, Genesis 1 verse 4. Now let me show you. Here is what would be called, right, whoops, what would be called a, uh, See that yod, that letter uh, yod would be considered the little jot like this right here. This is the yod right, right there. Okay, there's a little yod in, in writing. It's just a tiny little comma like an apostrophe almost. And then a tittle um, you'd see in, let me show you from the alphabet here. Watch this. Watch when I slide this up taking those letters from the alphabet. Now here's a bait and a cough, and what's the difference between them? Really just this right here. So sort of like for us, like the difference between an L and a T is just one little, one little scratch of your pen, and it's a different letter, right? In fact, it's aggravating that in texting, the capital I, in text, in whatever, uh, whatever that's called, whatever language texting is in, uh, the capital I and the lowercase l are the same letters, just, this, just that one line. But, but uh, just the smallest stroke of the pen, the curve of the pen as you lift it off the page, is the difference between one letter and another. And that's, that's, that's the kind of regard that Jesus has for, for the law, that there, there's not anything of it going to fail to be fulfilled. And so let's, let's go through some more points that Jesus makes about the law. He, he didn't, here, here are ways that I've chosen to say it, different people might depict it in different ways. But he, he didn't disregard the law, he stressed careful obedience to it in, uh, in chapter 5, uh, verses 19 and, and 20 that will uh, whoops, that we can uh, look at. I thought I had that text here. But that's where he said, um, whoever breaks one of these commandments to teach one so, one so will be least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps one of these least commandments and teaches men so shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. He stressed the necessity to show uh, scrupulous concern about keeping God's law. He claims to fulfill it, as we pointed out. And especially, now here's what I think is so great, especially in the Sermon on the Mountain, and that's what the SOTM is, and in himself, Jesus is really giving the fullest expression of what the law means. And what, why do I say that? What do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is you see in his, in his life, in his own words, in his own teaching, but also in his own life in his perfect obedience to the law in his very identity in his very mission all of this is be is in fulfillment of what what the law said so he embodies the law he embodies the perfect keeping of the law he embodies the ultimate meaning of the law and so by looking at the life of christ in the way he interacted with others and who he was and what he did you're seeing the torah the fullest expression of the torah that's an incredible claim to make
And what he does is he, he emphasizes the intent of, of the law and the reason behind keeping God's command, right? Or what we would call, and you need to be careful here because I know this can, be, this can be abused, but the spirit of the law. Now, I know people today sometimes when you try to tell them what, what God's word says, and they said, well, I don't have to worry about that as long as I'm keeping the spirit of the law. The spirit of the law is just God wants you to be nice to people. He, he just wants you to worship him. You know, it doesn't really matter about how you do it exactly, right? Just the spirit of the law. You just kind of get the vague um, underlying principles, and I don't have to be concerned about the particulars. Well, that's an abuse of the idea of the spirit versus the letter of the law. But you see Jesus doing that in those Matthean so-called antitheses there in that context. But, and also in chapter 15, where some of the Jewish leaders were avoiding keeping the, uh, the, the commandment to honor your father and mother, and they'd say, well, the money that I would give to support you, mom and dad, is the money I put in the collection plate, right? So they, they were uh, claiming that they could, couldn't show proper regard to honor their father and mother because they, they had to give to, to the Lord. And Jesus severely chastises them for that. And they might have thought, well, they're adhering to the letter uh, of the law, but of course, obviously, they were, they, they were not. And really, if they were concerned about the spirit of the law, they would not have uh, dreamed to act in that way. And in chapter 5, when he talks about, you know, murder, but, but I say, you've heard it said, you shall not uh, kill, but I say unto you, anyone who's angry with his brother. You've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say unto you, anyone um, who looks at a woman to lust after her has committed adultery. So in other words, the, the law required more than just what we might think of as just the outward uh, keeping of the letter of the law. Well, I haven't actually engaged in adultery. Jesus is stressing, though, what, what is God getting at behind that? Be true to your wife. Keep your heart and yourself for your covenant partner. All right? So that means don't, don't, even, be, don't, don't even lust after other, other women. Or what about you shall not kill? Well, what's the spirit really? What behind that is the proper regard for the well-being of your fellow Don't just disregard that. So that means I need to be careful even about being angry toward you and making sure I... Uh, control that anger, ma making sure I still, I don't let my anger disregard your right to be treated as a, as, a, as a fellow human being, right? So there's a lot more behind that law than just don't take a club and, uh, and club your, your brother over the head to death. So um, let me just finish, let me just read that and we're done. So these things uh, we might point out, some will say, well, the, the Jewish rabbis, some of them in rabbinic Judaism, they did teach some of these things. But that may be true, and you may even find it in some Greco-Roman sources, the idea of the spirit behind the law. But Jesus uniquely emphasized it and expressed it and intensified it in a way that is unique to our Lord. And that makes Matthew's uh, presentation of Jesus' treatment of the law so powerful. He, he stresses really the internalization of the law, not mere externalism. And I gave a couple of verses there. And then these two are not peculiar to Matthew, but when you take them into account with what Matthew said elsewhere in his gospel, I think you can see the point being when you internalize the law and you're not simply keeping the ritual of the law or just going through the motions, but when you really put the law on your heart, then you'll not only do gladly what the law says, but you'll go beyond that, right? That's what Jesus says, you know, if someone compels you to go one mile, go with them too. Someone takes your cloak, coat, give them your cloak also. So in other words, when you have the right attitude toward God's law, you, you, you won't limit yourself to just what you think is the letter of the law, but you'll give yourself to, and why? Because you love the lawgiver. You love the one whose law it is. And when that's your motivation, that Jesus said, that's the great commandment of the law, to love God with all of your heart, then uh, you will not only do what the law says, but you'll go, you'll, you'll go beyond that. So we'll talk about that a little bit more and finish that next time. And then what we're leading to is...
Uh, some other areas, uh, well, actually, I've renumbered that one. So disregard that in the file if you get it. But we're going to get to several other categories of theology and themes, and then the Christology of Matthew's Gospel, specifically how he presents to us the person of Christ. And then that, that'll be our last area to cover uh, about the Gospel of Matthew. So we'll, maybe we should rename this class more than you ever wanted to know about the Gospel of Matthew. <laughs> Thank you.